And a very good morning to you. Uh, do keep your Bibles open at page 876, 876, as we look at this passage from Luke chapter 17. I don't know if you noticed a sort of pattern in how the rotor works in this church. When it's um, a nice, cheerful, easy passage, the vicar gets to speak. <laughs> and when it's a tricky one, he delegates. <laughs> I see nods around from people who preach around me. I think we better pray. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, speak to each of us now as we look to what you tell us about your coming return. You always speak truth, even when it is challenging. We know that you want the best for us. Help us to share in the excitement, but also understand how you want each of us to live as we await that glorious day. Amen. Well, I uh, holidayed in Australia um, recently, in the Australian summer. It was lovely. And I was one thing that particularly struck me as I was sort of going around. Um, I was struck by the focus on fire warnings. You get colour-coded signs on the highways, on, in TV, in newspapers, grading the severity of the fire risk that day. It's taken very seriously. Um, whole communities can be wiped out by uh, bushfires when they happen. They spread like sort of wildfire. And even if there's no immediate threat, people are urged to, to prepare and be ready for if a fire comes. And most wisely do, actually. Well, it's interesting what we do and we don't prepare for, um, even when the warnings are just as strong. Um, the church takes climate warnings, as it should, really seriously. But it doesn't talk much, actually, these days about Jesus' return, let alone prepare for it. Um, it's quite different to the early church. They thought a lot about Jesus' early return. They thought it was quite imminent. But 2,000 years have now gone by, and we still await. Why should we expect it any time soon? Well, I wonder how you view Christ's return. Something of concern, something you think about, or something just quite distant, way beyond your lifetime. Well, this is what Jesus addresses in our passage today. He actually addresses what I think is the so what question. So I've titled today's talk, Jesus is returning, so what? Question mark. So what? Question mark. And I want to look at three themes from this passage. First, what Jesus wants us to know about his return. Second, the encouragement to be ready for it. And third, what being ready for his return actually looks like. So to begin with, what Jesus wants us to know, because he really wants us to know certain things. Firstly, in verses 20 and 30 in our passage, he tells us there's going to be a climax to history God is going to intervene. He is returning. It's a fact. Um, it's reckoned by those who sort of calculate these things that about 80% of biblical promises have now happened in the Bible. So we have every reason to think that the remaining 20%, which largely relate to his return in the final days, are going to happen. The second thing he really wants us to know that his return is going to be both sudden and obvious. It's going to be like what he turns in verse 24, a flash of lightning. And he's not talking literally. He's ra rather, he's talking about the sudden nature of his return, as lightning is sudden. And unlike his first coming, which happened in a stable, in a little backwater in Bethlehem, it's going to be very obvious to the world this time when he comes back. And it won't be predictable. Uh, John Lennon, the Beatles, said, life is what happens when you are making other plans. He isn't going to delay just because we're, say, only halfway through one of our Alpha courses here. He will come back when he wants to. Now, over the centuries, Christians have spent lots of time trying to work out exactly when Christ will return. They've tried to decipher passages in Daniel, Matthew, Revelation. And every day has been wrong. And it's not surprising. Because Jesus, not even Jesus, knows. 
In Matthew 24, verse 36, he says, But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. We like to have nice little checklists and timetables we can methodically tick off. I know I do. But that's not how it's going to be. Certainly there'll be signs, we're told in verse 23, but they're just as likely to be false signs or things that we misinterpret and go after the wrong things. Because to focus on timing is to focus on the wrong thing. Jesus wants us to refocus away from the where and the when and on to being ready whenever it happens. The third thing that Jesus really wants us to know about his return in verses 26 to 29 is that when it happens, life is just going to be carrying on normally in the same old way, people going blithely about their regular day-to-day routines, unaware of what's going to happen. It's going to be like what he terms the Old Testament days of Noah before the flood and the sudden demise of Sodom and Gomorrah. People were taken unawares. But his return is going to affect the whole world. Now we might think we live in a a stable, unchanging world. But as COVID showed us, our world can change overnight. Writer Marilyn Robinson said, When things are taking their ordinary course, it's hard to remember what matters. But that's just when we should be watchful. Like Australia is with all those fire warnings. And the fourth thing that Jesus wants us to know in this passage, in verses 30 to 37, is that his return is going to be accompanied by the judgment of humanity, living and the dead. In our 8.30 service, we recite the Nicene Creed every week. And it's set of one line in that says, He will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. You might say, I've committed my life to Christ. I'm saved. I know he'll return someday. But what difference does it make to how I live now? Well, Jesus says, actually, there's every difference. Judgment is an, an unfashionable idea these days. The church doesn't talk much about it generally. And we can think how we live our lives doesn't matter. But Jesus is clear. We will be held accountable for how we live. We live in a moral universe that God's created where sin does not go unnoticed. And no one will be excluded. The passage said some will be taken in judgment. Others will be with Jesus. Families are going to be torn asunder. Judgment is quite divisive. And it will be too late then to do anything about it. This is a really stark passage that Jesus presents us with. So to recap what Jesus wants us to know. He's coming back. It's going to be unpredictable. People will be carrying on as normal. And judgment will happen before the world is restored and renewed. But I want to turn now to what that means for us. And to start, I want to talk about there's a huge encouragement for us to be ready. Um, I remember my annual school sports days. I don't know if you all remember those. We had a whole heap of athletics events. I I was actually quite a good athlete when I was at school. And I won the best all-rounder trophy three years running for my athletes. (laughs) the only event I couldn't do was the high jump. I don't know if any of you, I was terrified of it. <laughs> but, uh, and I got a hero's reception when I got home with my trophy from my parents, I remember, each year. But this is going to be nothing compared with the hero's welcome that awaits us at the entrance to God's kingdom. Uh, the New Testament letter of 2 Peter majors on Christ's return. And in chapter 1, verses 10 to 11 in that letter, The writer says, Be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. 
For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God. You will be richly provided with an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God and our Saviour Lord Jesus Christ. And the Greek word used for entrance is the word that was, same word that was used for an Olympic champion um, returned home to their city. They got a hero's welcome. And that's the entrance that awaits us as well. But how do we get a hero's welcome? Well, that depends on how we choose to live, I think, and how ready we are. And that's our third theme and what I want to turn to now. And I want to highlight three things. Uh, Firstly, in verses 32 to 33, Jesus warns us not to look back like Lot's wife but instead to look ahead and keep our gaze on him. You might remember from Genesis 19, the story of Lot. He lived in a wicked city of Sodom, and God told Lot to flee with his family before the city was going to be destroyed. But he was crucially told not to look back when they flee. But while fleeing, Lot's wife did look back behind her to the city, and she was turned into a pillar of salt, Well, in 2014, I left my last employer, IBM. It was the start start of my ordination journey. And on my final day, I handed in my security pass to my computer, like you do when you leave an employer. And the offices were on the South Bank in central London, next to the National Theatre. And to get back to my tube station, after I'd handed in my pass and security, the laptop, um, I had to walk back over Waterloo Bridge. And as I was walking across Waterloo Bridge, I remembered Lot's wife. And I thought, I mustn't turn round for a final look back (laughs) over my shoulder at the IBM office. (laughs) But keep looking ahead to the new life that God now has in store for me. And here I am. (laughs) You might think it was a poor choice, but there we go. Verse 33 says, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. We're not to cling on to what lies behind us, our old life, like Lot's wife, because that leads nowhere good. Instead, we're to focus on what lies ahead of us, what we can do for God, so we in our world are ready for his return. That leads to life. But we can be, of course, held back from going ahead and keeping our gaze ahead by placing our security, for instance, in the wrong things and thinking too materially. We're not to be like the people of Noah's and Lot's days who became very comfortable and complacent, thinking the as-is is just going to last forever because they were caught napping. And it's not that we shouldn't plan for our future. We shouldn't plan for good pensions and things like that. It's rather, it's about holding on to things lightly. Not becoming so attached and dependent that pursuing and holding on to them completely drives how we live. So the first aspect of being ready is to keep looking ahead to Jesus and the new kingdom life, not to our old life behind us. The second thing is to be spotless. Um, Further on in the letter to 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 11 14, the writer specifically addresses what sort of people we should be as we await Jesus' return. And he's concerned that the early church, and us now, might just sit back and do nothing and wait. But his answer is simple. He says, be diligent to be found by Jesus without spot or blemish, at peace with him. We're to be spiritually spotless in terms of how we live. And that's after we've been saved. Well, I wonder if Jesus came back today. How spotless would he find us right now? It's worth thinking about. And how do we become spotless and blameless, as he says? 
Well, at one level, I think, it's about making sure we're filling ourselves with the right things so that, that don't contaminate us spiritually. What do we watch and read? Who do we associate with? Are we exposed to wholesome things and people? Uh, when a potter is making something on a wheel, you know, the potter's wheel, the critical thing is to get the clay really centred on the wheel at the start. Otherwise, centrifugal force, when you start moving the wheel, is going to send the clay flying off, or you're going to be fighting to have a really misshapen jug. Well, equally, where we position ourselves with God is crucial. Are we centred on God? Because if not, we'll become spiritually, if you like, off centre. And how do we stay centred? Well, we need to let God shape us and not the world. Um, my go to solution at home is this WD 40. <laughs> I was only using it only yesterday, in fact. It d fixes everything. <laughs> it, it's one of those products that really does do what it says on the tin. Drives out moisture, loosens rusted parts, frees sticky mechanisms. Well, we need daily squirts of spiritual WD-40. And what's that? It's reading God's word each day. Quiet times. Prayer. Being accountable. Being taking advantage of going to events like Bloom when they come up to recharge us. Because we're then better equipped, equipped to then start squirting the kingdom of God around the world each day. And becoming spotless, I think, is also about staying on course to our final destination. And I used to fly little aeroplanes, and I was taught to be constantly alert to the weather because it can knock you off course. And it's really easy to drift off course when you're flying. And how do you avoid that? Because by you, you keep constant watch on the instruments and keep making constant little tweaks on the controls. And the same applies to our spiritual lives. We have to be constantly alert to our spiritual state. And make constant little tweaks because it's so much easier than going way off course and then trying to yank yourself back on track. So, being ready is first about looking ahead to Jesus and our new life. It's about being spiritually spotless and blameless. And thirdly, it's about not just thinking of ourselves. God wants us to partner with him in transforming our world and bringing his kingdom closer to its fullness because we're either going to be changed by our culture or our culture is going to change us it's an either or which are we going to do in verse 21 of our passage Luke's, Jesus says to the Pharisees in fact the kingdom of God is in the midst of you in other words it's already here albeit it's not in its fullness yet that's what his second coming is going to achieve now that little phrase, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you, can also be translated, is within your grasp. In your grasp. And if something's within your grasp, you have to sort of reach out and act to get it, not sit back. We have a role to play in bringing God's kingdom to its fullness. And that contributes to the hero's welcome that awaits us. It means being a faithful daily witness for the kingdom, wherever God has put you being as Christ-like as possible, squirting the WD-40, spiritual WD-40 around. We're to play our part in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 16, 20, making disciples of the world so as many people hear the gospel, repent and turn to Jesus before he returns. So many more of our family and friends will go to a better place on Judgment Day. What better incentive? The Christian songwriter Chris Keith Green said, I'd rather have people hate me with the knowledge that I tried to save them. Let's not waste the opportunities that come before us to tell people about God and his kingdom so that more people are saved when he returns. So how do we prepare for Christ's return? We keep looking ahead to Jesus and his kingdom, not back to our old life like Lot. We put our security in the right things, 
We're spotless spiritually and we're faithful witnesses so that others have a chance to escape eternal judgment. It's been said that one of Satan's greatest deceptions is not so much to present us, prevent us believing in God or in Christ's return, but to make us believe there's no hurry to act and then we'll be caught napping. But Jesus in this passage says, on the contrary, there's every reason to hurry. I could come back at any time. Let me find you spotless and busy growing my kingdom when I return. Act now. Don't be caught napping and get a hero's reception. Amen. Well, let's just pause for a moment to just reflect on that. Think about perhaps how you think about now Christ's return, something distant, something you need to think more about. How ready are you for it? Are you keep, keep looking ahead to Jesus and his coming kingdom or being clinging back to an older life? How spotless are you spiritually? What are you doing wherever God's put you to sort of partner with him in bringing his kingdom closer? Let's just pause on that for a moment and then I'll close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we long for your return when you will renew the world and put everything right. May we be found by you alert, excited and ready for your return, but also busy partnering with you in bringing your kingdom closer to its fullness. And speak to each of us now, and with the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit, help us to become ready for your glorious return. Amen.